This programme covers stainless steel and how to weld it using the gas tungsten arc welding process. In it, we'll explain what stainless steel is, the different types, their properties and applications, before moving on to the practical aspects of welding stainless steel. So it would be helpful if you had a basic knowledge of the gas tungsten arc welding process. Take a look at manufacturing today, and it's hard to find an industry that hasn't been affected by the development and use of stainless steel. From cars to aerospace, catering to architecture, chemical processing and nuclear power generation. The applications for this relatively new metal alloy are enormous and continue to grow. But why is it so popular? The key to its widespread use lies in its corrosion resistance or stainless properties, particularly in the face of aggressive environments. It also offers excellent resistance to heat, an ability to maintain its strength at extreme temperatures, both elevated and sub-zero, and good ductility, enabling it to be formed and stretched into complex shapes. Also, due to its corrosion resistance, it has aesthetic appeal, being used widely in architectural applications with a variety of surface finishes. Add the critical nature of many stainless steel applications where weld quality is of vital importance and the choice of welding process usually comes down to one, gas tungsten arc welding, or GTAW. GTAW produces a hot but very localized arc, allowing maximum heat to be applied in a small area. The arc can be controlled by the operator, giving a neat weld finish. It produces no spatter, so after-weld cleaning is minimized. The result is a clean, high-quality weld with excellent penetration and good properties compared to other welding processes. This versatile process can be carried out manually or by machine. On the negative side, it is slow and, if performed manually, requires more skill than some other welding processes. But for critical applications, the end result is worthwhile. In this video, we'll be looking at the practical requirements for welding stainless steel, from equipment setup to choice of consumables, to common problems and solutions, with practical tips as we go. But before we begin, let's take a closer look at the material we'll be working with and its extraordinary properties. The commercial production of steel can be traced back to August 1856, but it wasn't until 1913 that the first arc furnace cast of stainless steel was made by Harry Brearley in Sheffield. Brearley was experimenting with alloy steels for making gun barrels, and among the samples he discarded was one containing about 14% chromium. Months later, he noticed that while the steels had rusted, the chromium steel remained bright. This was due to a chromium-rich layer of oxide. This thin oxide layer is not porous and prevents the stainless steel from reacting with oxygen and water in the atmosphere. If this thin layer is scratched, it will reform almost instantaneously, maintaining the protection to the material. This early stainless steel was an alloy of just two metals, chromium and iron. Today it contains other elements besides chromium and is grouped into main categories according to its structure, which determines the mechanical and physical properties of the alloy. These categories are austenitic, ferritic, martensitic and duplex stainless steel. Austenitic stainless steels contain from 16 to 28% chromium, 3.5 to 32% nickel, up to 7% molybdenum, and only a small amount of carbon, up to 0.15%. They're stabilized with titanium, niobium, and copper. Owing to their good corrosion resistance and excellent welding properties, they're the most widely used group. The most basic and cheapest form contains 18% chromium and 8% nickel. The structure gives good corrosion resistance, ductility and toughness, particularly at low temperatures. In addition, fully austenitic alloys are non-magnetic. 
Ferritic stainless steels are iron chromium alloys containing between 10.5 and 30% chromium and a low carbon content of less than 0.08%, with some ferritics containing up to 4.5% molybdenum and up to 1.6% nickel. Titanium and niobium are added as stabilizing compounds. They're not as corrosion resistant or weldable as austenitic steel, owing to the absence of nickel, but they do have good mechanical properties and good formability. They're less costly and are used for car trims and exhaust components. Martensitic stainless steels contain between 13 and 17% chromium, with up to 4% nickel and 0.1 to 1% carbon. They derive their strength from the hard martensitic phase. Further increases in strength can be obtained by the addition of alloying elements such as copper, titanium, niobium, aluminium, and molybdenum. They have high hardness and tensile strength and good high temperature creep strength, but low corrosion resistance compared to other stainless steels. They're mainly used in cutlery and for applications in mildly corrosive environments. Duplex stainless steels comprise between 21 and 28% chromium, 3.5 to 8% nickel, up to 4.5% molybdenum, and between 0.05 and 0.35% nitrogen. They're designed to combine the optimum properties of both austenitic and ferritic steels, having high strength and offering excellent resistance to stress corrosion cracking. Typical applications are for pipe works in the nuclear and chemical industries. Now, having defined the different stainless steel groups, let's now have a closer look at the practical aspects of welding stainless steel. Mel's going to take us through the equipment. First of all, Mel, the power source. The power source, the power is turned on. We have to select the polarity of the current that we're going to use. In the case of stainless steel, this will be DC electrode negative. We now select the current that will be used, the amount of current, and for the job that we have on the desk, I would suggest about 80 amps should suffice. The high frequency should be selected in the star position. This is so that the HF will extinguish after the arc is established. Yeah. The current control we have on remote because we're going to be able to use the foot switch as a variable current control towards the end of the job. Right. I've already preset the pre-gas flow rate and the post-gas flow rate to protect the pool and the tungsten after the arc is extinguished. So we should be ready to go. Fine. Let's move on to the torch next. The torch is water-cooled of a lightweight plastic design. It carries the water cooling, it carries the welding power, it also carries the gas supply to the torch. We're using a thoriated tungsten. We've ground quite a sharp angle at 30 degrees on there because we're using quite low currents. As the amperage increases on a job, so you increase the size of the tungsten and broaden the angle at the tip. Right. What about the ceramic tip there? That's obviously set for the job in hand. Yeah, you can get different diameter ceramics. This one should suffice for the, the type of work we're doing here. Fine. What about the gas? The gas itself, argon is the traditional gas for TIG rolling of stainless steel. We find, however, that using argon hydrogen mixtures such as pure shield P1 has a beneficial effect. The hydrogen has a reducing effect and cleans up the oxides. It also produces a more stable arc at lower amperages. Fine. What about uh, the flow rate for this? The flow rate will set on the indicator here. I'll just operate the foot switch to turn the gas supply on. We've got it set at around 10 litres per minute, which is good for this type of work. Good. Right. We suggest between 8 and 12 litres per minute is a, a good range. The other part of the, uh, the makeup really is the filler wire, isn't it? Yeah, we're welding 316 austenitic stainless steel, so we select a 316 filler wire to be used with it. They come in various diameters depending on the thickness of metal that you're welding and the amperage that you'll be welding with. We always suggest it's a good idea to bend the end of the wire over first. You can imagine if this is being held in the hand, the sharp end, uh, if somebody's walking past, it can catch them. It's also, when you're using short lengths of weld, it's a good idea just to cut the filler wire in half. This is going to give you more control as you're operating the, the weld. Right, so onto the bench. First of all, 
Let's talk, talk a little bit about the work, because, uh, again, cleaning of the work is vital, isn't it? Yes, it is. All this material has been degreased away from this working area. Um, we suggest away from the working area because they are solvents and a, uh, there is a flammability problem. We also suggest the use of stainless steel wire brushes for cleaning of material, uh, abrasive pads or wire wool, not only for the cleaning of the base material, but perhaps also for the filler wire as well. Yeah, and protective clothing. Yeah, we're, we're wearing flame retardant overalls to cover the skin because the arc emits radiation which can burn the skin. We're also wearing thin leather gloves to protect the skin from burning, but also to give us the feel necessary when we're holding the torch. Yeah, and the head shield? The head shield, <clears throat> we've selected the correct shade of lens to be used for the amperage that we're using on this job. And the size of the head shield will protect the side of the face and the neck from being burnt. Okay, so we're all protected but uh, not quite ready. The ventilation's important too. Yes, uh, welding fume can be hazardous, so we would always recommend the use of a local extraction unit such as this time. Right, so to the work then. What are we going right. to see? What we'll see first of all is a straightforward fillet weld. This is on three millimeter thick material. I'll move your pedal if underneath, you'll move ready. My foot pedal for there me, we are. thank you. And what we'll be looking at are the torch angles to be used. The torch is, I'm right handed, so I'm holding the torch in the right hand. We bisect the angle, the 90 degree angle of the fillet world, with the torch. So the torch is going at an angle of 45 degrees. However, in this plane, we have a small lead on the torch so that we can see the arc and see the world pull. The filler wire will be held in the left hand and introduced into the front of the weld core. So this means keeping a very shallow angle between the filler wire and the base plate, possibly yep. 10 to 20 degrees. And you just dip that wire in as you go? The wire will be dipped into the front of the weld core. It's important to, first of all, establish the weld core on the fillet weld so the weld covers both sides of the plate. Right. And when that's created, we can then add the filler wire. So a short pause as you start, OK. So if you'll mind your eyes. Okay, just getting the weld pulled across both sides of the plate now. Now I can add the filler wire. Now on this one, you're using material of the same thickness, so you're aiming the torch where, Mel? Directly at the root of the joint, right in the corner. Looks like a very well-controlled flow there at the moment. Yes, it's a very precise process. Presumably, then, if the material to be welded were of dif differing thicknesses, you would, you would aim the torch pre predominantly at the thicker material, would you? That's correct. On dissimilar thickness joints, uh, yeah. you concentrate on the thicker section. I'll just stop there. Leaving the torch in position for a few moments so that the gas shield can cover the weld as it solidifies. And there we stop. So, as I hope you can see, a reasonably well built up filler world and not very much oxidation because of the effect of the argon hydrogen. Excellent. Okay. You mentioned earlier the use of dissimilar thickness materials. Here we have a lap joint that's been set up in two different thickness materials. We have 1.6 millimeter on the bottom plate and 2.5 millimeter on the top plate. We'll try this as a lap world to look at the effects that you were talking about, playing the arc on the, thi the thicker section. You'll also notice that it's quite closely tacked together. This is because of the problems with stainless steel and distortion. We need to keep that gap as close as possible. Right. Just one other final point. I've used this filler wire on the previous weld, and you can see now that the end of the wire is oxidised. It's good practice always just to snip the end of that oxide off so that now, when we start the new weld, it's clean filler wire going into the weld pool. So rather than the conventional 45 degree angle, you may see me concentrating more on the top plate, so a shallower angle. Mind your eyes. There we are, the arc's established fairly quickly again. Yeah. And we try and get the whirlpool to cover both sides. And now I'm trying to add enough filler wire to build up a good profile between the top and the bottom plate. And those circles as you go along, they're an indication of how fast you're going? They're an indication of the frequency that I add the filler wire. Yeah. They're the ripples that are produced by the filler wire being added to the whirlpool. So in fact, the gas is cooling it fairly quickly, isn't it? Yes, it is. OK, I'll just hold it there. Again, let the gas play over until the world is finely solidified. And there you can see a blend between the top plate and the bottom plate. Again, very little oxidation. Yeah. So in practice, this would now just have abrasive pad rubbed over and it would be cleaned up. Excellent. OK. So 
This is straightforward TIG rolling that we've seen here on different thicknesses. We can look at some very thin material now and look at the use of pulse TIG rolling. This is where we have a background current of a certain amperage, but at frequencies we pulse in a higher current. The ability is to produce enough heat to make this weld, but to reduce the amount of heat going into the job. Will you be using filler wire on this? On this particular joint, no. This is an outside corner. I should be able to blend in both sides of the material to make the world so without having to use filler wire. Right, so we'll reset the power source now. We reset the power source and we switch the pulse system on, on this switch. And I've already previously preset that we're going to have two pulses per second and that the background current will be 50% of the peak current. I believe the peak current wants to be 50 amps. So in effect, twice a second we will have 25 amps being pulsed to 50 amps. Got it. OK. <clears throat> so this would be a melt run or touch this world without filler on an outside corner joint. So if you'll mind your eyes. Now there's the arc was established fairly quickly, but you can now see see the pulse in the effect, pulse, can't, can't you? you? Yeah. I'm just weaving the torch a little just to make sure that both sides of this world blend. How close are you getting that electrode, Mel? As close as I dare without actually firing the electrode. On these low amperage works, it pays to keep as close an arc as you can. Okay, we'll stop it there. Again, just let the gas play over the pool until it's solidified. And now we can see a fairly neat weld that's blended in both sides of the material. A full strength weld is made. Very little oxidation because of the effects of argon hydrogen. Another abrasive patch should clean that up. Just clean up. Excellent. Or okay. if it was the corner of a cabinet that you were manufacturing, for example, you could just lightly grind and clean up and you have a okay. clean surface. The last one to have a look at on the thin section is a bus weld. And you can see the amount of tax I put. Very close tax on this because of this distortion problem. I don't want the gap to fall apart. Again, I'm going to use pulse welding. And we'll leave a, an air gap at the back in case we have penetration through the plate. Again, I'm going to try this autogenous. If the fit-up is good enough, we should be able to blend both pieces of material together. If the fit-up weren't good enough or we wanted more of a, a full build-up on this side, we'd add filler wire. Right. There goes the arc. I'm not pulsing again. Yeah, you can see that uh, quite low background current with the 50 amp pulse coming in. And presumably because of the pulse, you're less likely to distort the work, are you? I'll stop it there. If we had done this just standard TIG rolling, we would probably have used nearly 50 amps to melt the, the parent plate together, mm. but of course it would be 50 amps all the time. Here we've reduced the background, so there's a lot less heat, therefore less distortion in the job. I hope you can see a, a pleasant looking world there that's joined both surfaces together. Have we got penetration? Look at the back, and yes we have. We can see the penetration bead just breaking through there. You'll also notice, however, that with stainless steel, because uh, the oxygen in the air has managed to get to the world, how heavily oxidised that is. Mm. If it were high quality work, we would have to purge the back of this with an inert gas to prevent this oxidation. But in standard industrial use, this would be acceptable because this would just be ground and polished off and you have a complete world. Right. We'll do more on purging in a few moments' time. That's the thin section. Presumably it works just as well on the thick section. Yes, it does. We'll need a larger tungsten electrode, a larger authority tungsten. We will probably use a shallower angle because of the higher current's being used. Uh, but let's have a look and see. OK, we'll reset everything for that. We've now reset to weld thicker material. Mel, tell me how we've uh, rejigged the, the equipment, first of all. We've, we're using a higher amperage here now, 125 amps in this case, and because of this, we've had to use a larger diameter tungsten than before. This was the previous electrode that we used, a 2.4 diameter thoriated tungsten, and we're now using a 3.2. You'll also notice the difference in the angle that I've ground on the end of the tungsten. It's a 30 degree included angle on the smaller tungsten to aid the stability at lower amperages. But for higher amperages, we need to aid the tip retention, the tip life, so we use a broader point. Right. And this piece of work is substantially thicker than what we've seen so far, so... Yes, it is. I'm attempting to show a vertical corner weld here on 8mm thick material. 
you'll notice the gap because we need to get good fusion through to the back. You'll also notice that we put a root run in, the first pass, and then the filling runs are two quite narrow stringer beads, as they're called, because we need to keep the heat input down on stainless steel. We don't want very large, wide weaves on the stainless steel. This world is now filled. We can now cap off, as it's called, by putting maybe one, two, three runs across the top. Have you used different filler wires than to before? The filler wire is a larger diameter than before. I used 1.6 before. This is 2.4 millimeter diameter. Right. Let's go through this then. So if you'll mind your eyes. There's the August You can see in effect, we're attempting to keep the same angles as before, but just now, in the vertical position. Yeah. Still just dipping into the weld pool as it appears. Yeah. How far away are you keeping the tip for the thicker material, Mel? This I'm keeping a little further away uh, because of the build up of of weld behind the weld pull, there was a danger of fouling. So I've kept a slightly longer arc gap. I hope to be able to blend the material over to the side to cap off, and now I'll put one more pass, and maybe another one to finally finish the job. Right, that's fine. Presumably then, because the gas is cooling the, uh, the filler wire as it's going in, there's no danger of it dripping down as you're doing a vertical weld. Well, that is amperage control. You have to keep a fairly close control of the amperage. If it's too hot, of course, the material will be too molten and will fall down. Uh, too little amperage and you run the risk of lack of fusion. OK. Now, we mentioned purging earlier on. Let's go into uh, some more detail on that. If we can move over to the other bench there and go into some detail about purging. Let me move the extractor away. We saw there quite thick section pipe. Well, we have here quite thick section pipe. We saw there how we had to have a weld preparation to enable a full fusion weld to be placed. And here you can see we've prepared the pipe by machining to give us a, uh, an area to weld into. This will be joined to the next pipe. Purging this is very important because this is maybe going to be used in the food industry or in the chemical industry where if there is any oxidation and therefore pits, corrosion can uh, attack. And we can show this by the inside of this pipe. This has been purged with a gas that contained 2% of oxygen. This is 20,000 parts per million. Mm -hmm. You can see heavily oxidized, very open to corrosive attack. You'll also notice that it hasn't really fused very well. The world hasn't particularly spread very well. Under exactly the same conditions of amperage and, and procedure, this world was produced using 1,000 parts per million, which is the industrial norm yeah. of oxygen in the purge gas. That's 0.1%. You can see far less oxidation now. And also, the world has spread uh, more evenly on the underside so that we ha now have good fusion. But of interest is this one, which was purged with 20 parts per million compared to 1,000 parts and compared to 20,000 parts, just 20 parts per million of oxygen. Now you can see virtually no oxidation at all. This has improved the corrosion resistance immeasurably so that it's almost equal to the parent material itself. Also, the weld has spread very, very evenly. No Excellent problems with lack of fusion. And there is, of course, equipment that will help you judge how much oxygen is going through. Yes, we use oxygen sensing monitors. Uh, here is a light display that the lights will, will go down to the amount of oxygen that's in the purge gas. So it will record 5,000 parts per million right down to one part per million. Uh, as I say, our recommendation would be between 25 and 50 parts per million. Right. What about the flow of gas? The flow of gas, this... Uh, LCD can be put into the line and will display the, the flow rate in litres per minute. OK, moving on. We need to dam the ends of the pipe so that you don't try to purge a very, very large area. You want to attempt to keep the purging area to perhaps 12 inches either side of the joint. Now, this is OK if we use inflatable bladders, if we can get to the other end of the pipe after it's been welded and remove the bladders. But if we can't, you can use soluble dams such as this this gets taped in using a soluble tape, and then afterwards the system is washed away and the dams and the tape are, are washed away. But they are gas tight during the welding operation. Yeah. Conventionally, though, you would use a tape such as this, a heavy industrial tape, to ensure there were no leaks in your damming system. 
Right, really. thanks, Mel. Before we move on to the gas combinations, what about this small piece of pipe you have here? Yeah, this thin, thin section pipe, uh, there have been recent developments in mechanised teak welding, particularly orbital teak welding, that have proved very beneficial on this sort of section. Uh, the gases that we would use on that, we've used for the manual welding 1.5% hydrogen in argon in pure shield P1, but we find with mechanised welding we can make larger additions of hydrogen, such as 5% hydrogen in, in argon, and also helium argon hydrogen mixtures such as this are very beneficial when orbitally TIG welding. It must be remembered though that whenever you use above 2% hydrogen in the shielding gas, you must use a hydrogen regulator which has a left-hand thread. So, Mel, what other difficulties would you experience in welding stainless steel? Most stainless steels are austenitic and as such are readily weldable as long as the precautions mentioned before are taken. Uh, a problem with austenitic stainless steels, though, can be hot cracking, and this is caused by silicon and phosphorus present and causes cracking along the weld join. It's overcome by having at least 5% ferrite in the weld metal. Austenite, as such, is very corrosion resistant but has very little strength. The ferrite, ferrite is needed to add the strength to the weld. Right, and what about expansion? The coefficient of expansion is very high, and we've seen the problems that this can lead to with distortion. Ways of overcoming this are very close tacking, restraint where possible, a balanced technique of welding, maybe stitch welding, and also as low a heat input as possible. Close arc gaps are also essential. Right, now ferritic stainless steel has its own problems, doesn't it? Ferritic stainless steel is less readily weldable than austenitic stainless steel. This is because after the welding process, a coarse grain structure can develop. This makes the metal uh, not ductile. It can cause it to become brittle and break. Ways of overcoming this are to adopt a very low heat input process and a very rapid cooling rate. The other grade of stainless steel is martensitic stainless steel. These are the least easy to weld. Uh, the problem is caused by a high, high carbon content that can lead to embrittlement in the heat affected zone. Ways of reducing this problem are to have a very strict pre and post heat treatment. Okay Mel, thank you very much indeed. Well that brings us to the end of this video from which we now hope you have an understanding of stainless steels and their applications and how to weld them using the gas tungsten arc welding process. There's no doubt that as the applications for stainless steel become ever more varied and ever more critical, gas tungsten arc welding operators with the necessary skills will remain very much in demand. You have just seen one of an expanding series of B 